All right, all right, Red Nation. Today we're gonna to be talking about the dose area product, also called the Kerma area product. How can we have a way to keep track of the radiation dose during a fluoroscopy procedure, for instance, that the patient is receiving? Coming up here at Howard Dialogy Works, I'm gonna draw a 2D view of our x-rays coming down. So these are x-rays coming down from our x-ray tube. Our image receptor is down here and our patient is right here in the middle, lying on the table. And what we would like to do is have a way that we could make a measurement close to our x-ray tube, and it could tell us something about the radiation, which is actually incident on our patient. Well, if you remember, one way that we can measure radiation dose in air is something actually called the kerma. This ion chamber right here, we can measure the kerma. This is just a fancy way of saying the kinetic energy that's released per unit mass. The units there of the kinetic energy is joules per kilogram. And if you remember what joules per kilogram, that's just gray. So this is the kinetic energy released in air. It's not to be confused with a measurement which is made inside of the patient. They have the same units, which can be kind of confusing. They're both measured in units of gray or milligray, but what we have here is a measurement in air. For simplicity in fluoroscopy, a lot of times we are just tracking the kerma and also specifically how much area is irradiated because the kerma measures how much energy is gonna be released per unit mass. And then we also wanna take into account how big of an area is irradiated on the patient. Remember, we're just drawing this two-dimensional slice of our x-ray beam. So if we draw one line here, that's representing the area which is gonna be irradiated by our x-ray beam. We wanna define is this product that we call the Kerma area product. And it is gonna be just the, that we talked about here, multiplied by the area that's gonna be irradiated. This is also called the dose area product because Kerma is just a unit for the dose that's measured in air. If we have a little rectangular area, we can think about that is being measured in centimeters on one side by centimeters on the other side for the area that the x-rays are gonna be irradiating. We're gonna have centimeters multiplied by centimeters or centimeters squared. You can see here, we have our two, we have a dose area product meter. Then you can see the beam that is actually irradiating the patient here. Then an important question is, how does the Kerma area product change as a function of the distance from the x-ray tube. We're often gonna be measuring the Kerma area product very close to the x-ray tube. We have the distance measurement there, and then we also have our Kerma measurement there with an ion chamber, for instance. And then how does that actually change as you move further away from the x-ray tube, right? Because we're actually concerned about the irradiation of our patient, which is way down here. If you remember from our exposure factors video, the exposure actually goes like one over R squared, where R is the distance from the X-ray tube. And the area, this beam is diverging, so it's gonna be covering a larger area. So the area is actually going like R squared. So that is a nice thing about the way that the Kerma area product is developed. Namely, the Kerma area product or the dose area product do not depend on the distance from the x-ray tube. So this is a nice thing. As you move your patient up or down, the Kerma area product that you're going to be reporting is actually going to be the same. And that's why you can make your Kerma area product measurements up here, right close to the x-ray tube. So later on, when you're interpreting your Kerma area product, you're gonna need to keep that in mind. But for the actual Kerma area product itself, it is going to be independent of the distance from the x-ray tube. If you looked at the dose area product in this rectangle right here, again, the rectangle is smaller, but the relative exposure is higher than as you come down here because of our one over R squared. If you measure the dose area product at any given distances from our x-ray tube, you're actually gonna come up with the same measurements. What if we have a harder x-ray beam? So in the case that we have a harder x-ray beam, that means more of our x-rays are of higher energy on average. And we actually are gonna be passing those x-rays through the patient. And if we want roughly the same signal measured on the detector, 
then it's actually easier to pass those higher energy x-rays. They will penetrate more easily through the patient onto the detector. The Kerma area product will go down if you have a harder x-ray beam. There's more sophisticated ways now where we can actually model the inside of the human body and try and actually take our number that we have our Kerma area product, and we can try and convert that to an effective dose. So to do that, we need to make some assumptions about the way that the organs are positioned within the body. When we have our Kerma area product, it's more strongly going to influence the organs which are towards the surface, and it's less strongly going to influence things that are towards the bottom that are closer to the image receptor, assuming that we're keeping the detector signal fixed. For a head, you're usually looking on values around one half of a gray per centimeter squared for the Kerma area product. And for an abdomen, you're usually looking at about two and a half gray per centimeter squared for a radiograph of the abdomen, for an AP abdomen. And these are for adults, and these are just approximate conversion factors because like we talked about, it's really gonna be dependent on a number of factors that you could model. But if you want just a high level approximation, you can look at approximate conversion factors. The approximate conversion factor for a head is actually 0 0.03 millisieverts as on the top because we wanna to convert to the effective dose. And then on the bottom is gray centimeter squared. If you're talking about a body exam, for instance, in the abdomen, 0 0.25 per gray centimeter squared is the conversion. The relativity of the brain is relatively lower. So this is one reason why this number, this conversion factor is relatively smaller than this conversion factor in the abdomen. Imagine that you had the question that there was a barium enema that was performed. And during the barium enema, you had a Kerma area product that was 40 gray centimeter squared. What's the approximate effective dose for this exam. If it's an adult patient, we can then use this conversion factor here. We can multiply this times our 0.25 millisieverts per gray centimeters squared. And this is so fun, just crossing off terms so that our dose is actually going to be in millisieverts. And then if you measure four times 0.25, you get one, right? So because we have another zero here, it's actually going to be 10 millisieverts. The effective dose for this barium enema is about 10 millisieverts. And being able to do these kind of calculations quickly is nice so that you can just have a relative order of magnitude. Being able to do these calculations quickly is nice so you can get a quick feeling as to the radiation dose that the patient is receiving. Having fancier mechanisms that can do modeling that can provide better estimations of the effective dose is gonna be the next step and something that the vendors are already starting to provide on your fluoroscopy system so that you can actually look at the effective dose from some of these acquisitions. So now you really understand the Kerma area products well, see our video on fluoroscopy to get the high level of how the fluoroscopy procedures actually work.